Good afternoon. I'm Mohale Mashekho. Uh, it's so good to see you all. Thank you for taking time out of your weekend to come hang out with us and talk about books. So today we're talking about the outsiders. Um, but this is always very, if you've, if you've been to one of my sessions, you know I'm about to do this because I love icebreakers. So I'm with Terry and Leturutle and Onke. And always at the beginning, authors are very shy. And then you kind of, you know, bring them out of their shell and then they won't stop talking. So I'm here to make sure <laughs> I bring them out of their shell and then I make sure that they don't talk too much. So this is what we're going to do. Um, it's kind of like a game show now. I just need to get my clock out. Oh, dear Lord. <laughs> so I'm going to ask you to do an elevator pitch of your book. And you only have 60 seconds. And I'm going to, when the alarm goes off, I'm going to, so you can hear it. You only have 60 seconds. You only have 60 seconds to convince these good people that you wrote something amazing. So I'm going to start with Anke because you look so scared. <laughs> go. Okay, go. So take Catcher in the Rye and take the Spud books and put them together <laughs> and then put a black voice on it, a lot of hip hop, a lot of noise, young boy, mental health problems, suicide, grade 11, grade 12, he's trying to figure life out, but he gets there. Girl gets in the way, but she could be this solution or could be the problem. But somehow, I think he'll be all right. Wow, okay, firstly, you Damn. have 30 seconds to go, so he's obviously <laughs> the, the winner right now. I don't, wow. know, I don't know what Let's Hotel is going to do, but let's see. H hold on, I need to go back to... Reset it. Okay, go. Um, trying to locate yourself um, within a third culture and dealing with trying to learn how to love after the experience of trauma coming to terms with the fact that you e have, have even been traumatized, and re-educating yourself about your body as a woman, um, I think. 37 okay. seconds to go. <laughs> now she's the winner. <laughs> okay, no pressure, terri mm. No pressure at all. Go. Um, yeah, so, want to read about colored people? Buy my book. <laughs> 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 okay, Terry, you win. <laughs> you can, you win. <laughs> thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to start with Anke again. We always want to know um, where people, where writing came to people, or how people came to writing. And I mean, you're you're a psychologist. You're a serious person. You're not a clown like the rest of us. <laughs> so, <laughs> how how did you go? Okay, I I want to go to the clown show and do a little bit of writing. Um, for most of my life, I've considered myself a creative, and I think throughout my life, it was always this battle between the academic side of me and the creative side. So in high school, I knew I wanted to do fine art, but my mother was like, she's not having it. Um, so I went and did quantity surveying, um, lasted a year and a half in that before dropping out to become a rapper. Oh, wow. Wow, okay, that, yeah. I didn't see that coming. <laughs> <laughs> that lasted all of 18 months, um, and then I found my way back in school, started working again, but the creative side was always there. Um, I've dropped out twice in my life before, so a few years ago I also dropped out of a PhD to write this book, and I think it was that battle of the creative and the academic, but through writing it feels like everything's come together, because it's life experience, it's um, researchability, it's uh, life experience, um, passion, abilities, all those things coming together. So. It just felt like the right time, and it was just another creative outlet, I feel. Do you feel that being a psychologist somehow uh, informs how you wrote a second verse? Absolutely, I think so. Um, it almost feels like the psychology feeds into the writing, and it was one of the things I needed to do in order to mature from a writing perspective to get to the point where I am. Um, the book itself, I don't like to say it's about my life, but when people ask me questions, I feel like the client on the other side and they are the patient or mm -hmm. the therapist. Um, and I realize just how much of myself I put into it. So in a sense, it's also very therapeutic. Um, many, many years ago, back in 2008, I think it was, after a five-year relationship ending, I started journaling. And at the time, I thought I was going to take all this fabulous material and turn it into a novel. Um, it didn't turn out quite that way, but I think the practice of writing on a daily basis got me to a point where I felt like, you know what, let me try my hand at fiction and 
yeah, it, a book came out. And this idea, uh, so last night I asked Yawande, Pumla, and Sikhe how the idea comes to you. This particular idea, how did it come to you or how did you get to the idea? Um, I, one of my favorite authors is Stephen King. And one of the things that I, he said, which I really like, was that he feels the story is already there and he sort of chisels it out of a block of something. And when I think about where the story started, um, I mean, loving horror writing, I thought I was writing a horror story. It started off as a boy falling in love with a woman who turns into a werewolf and comes from a family of werewolves. Now, I want to read that one. Can you write that one next? I can give you draft one. <laughs> it was badly written, though. Um, but then it became a refining process where I was constantly whittling it down to what is the essence of this. And then yeah. being asked that question in workshops on writing, what am I trying to do? I realized that a coming of age story is something that's really important to me because of the ones that have influenced my life and also just the work I do in therapy um, in some ways always comes back to a person's coming of age story. And so that it made sense for me to write that kind of story. That's interesting that you say, um, last night somebody said writers are always obsessed with one idea and we always think we're writing something completely different but we are obsessed with that one idea and you talk about coming of age. Terry and I want to know, when you look at your novel and then um, the short stories, do you get a sense that you are obsessed with one idea? And what is that one idea? Yeah. Uh, definitely. I think, I think I went into this from the beginning knowing that I'm going to write about one thing a thousand ways. <laughs> so um, I'm obsessed with this idea of identity and not necessarily colored identity, which I write a lot about as a colored person, but about the making of oneself through these communities that we exist in, making yourself as colored, making yourself as queer, making yourself as a woman, as gender diverse. How do we become in these different identities. And I think in everything that I'm ever gonna write, uh, there will always be that element of finding yourself in your community. I like that. I think I'm also obsessed with, I think I'm obsessed with secrets, actually. Why, why do we keep secrets? In all of my writing, there's always somebody keeping a secret. I don't know if this explains my relationships, but we won't get into that. <laughs> it explains why your short stories don't have the, the ending. The <laughs> Excuse me, excuse me. I, uh, I'm the moderator <laughs> here. Okay, we're here to talk about your work, not mine. Let's go. Let's Do you think there is what? What is the the idea that you're obsessed with in your poetry and also in this novella? Do you do you have an idea that there's a theme that you're constantly working through? Um, someone pointed out what my theme was uh, yesterday, actually, and they said I talk a lot about uh, relationships between old, old and the young. I think um, that. That is a theme that keeps cropping up in my work, for sure. And how did, so I know you started off doing poetry. How did the novella come to you? How did the idea come to you? Or how did you get to the idea? Um, so the, what happened was I was trying to write a novel. And I couldn't, I, it kept coming out in fragments. I would write just a chunk of something. And then I just couldn't write anything. And then I'd write another chunk. And this just kept happening. And eventually it built into this fractured novella and it was interesting because I was writing it in a period where I was going through a lot of I think I was having maybe a psychotic breakdown and I think my mind felt fragmented and it was reflected in the form of the writing. Sure. Speaking of form I was very interested when I was reading The Frightened because at first I was like all these poems mm. that together make up a story. I had yeah. to read it a couple of times, and I mm. wanted to, to find out from you the form. I know you said mm. fragmented, but even when you got to like the end, where you like, let me just put this together, let me yeah. format it this way. Yeah. Uh, I don't. Maybe uh, what happened as I continued is it became easier to formulate like a more conventional, long, uh, I started to understand what I was trying to say more. In the beginning, I, honestly, I didn't even think these fragments would amount to a story. I had no idea I was creating a story. I just knew that I was getting out small chunks in a week, and I would just sit and be like, okay, that was out, and I would do it again. And it, when I tried to put them all together, that's when I started building the novella. I was trying to put all these fragments together. Um, so I think towards the end, I started to just write more, just instead of just spilling things out, I started to really think about what I was doing and, and writing in a more considered way. 
But you know, I know you're saying it came out fragmented, but I feel like that's how we all write, right? Yeah. You have this moment and then you're like, yes! And then you stop and you go, okay, where's the juice? Where's the mojo? I had it, now I don't. And Terry, you also have a way of experimenting with, with form. Particularly, you have this very interesting short story, um, Fight Club. <laughs> It's actually one of my favorites, and I, I don't know if that's what you were going to read. Legit. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I, so you, you have a way of telling the story, but also, you know, it's kind of like a script, but then it is also a story. And I wanted to know how you, you work with form in your short stories. Yeah, I'm so, I'm very interested in the, in the unconventional. So I, I remember I studied English literature and failed. And <laughs> <laughs> very was, honest, thank I, you. I need to say this before someone goes to tax and asks. Um, and I, I studied modernism and it was actually one of my favorite sections was modernism. And when I learned about stream of consciousness, I was like, mm. But that's how people speak in like, especially like black and colored communities. When, when, when a, a colored person uh, is telling a story, they'll start here and then they'll go there and then they'll make a sound effect mm -hmm. and then they'll go there. And then, and I was like, what if I wrote the way colored people speak? And then these different forms and in the different ways that I tell my stories came out. Um, so I always, yeah, I think, Okay, and I'm going off the train now. <laughs> no, it's okay. We're with you. We're on the train. With are we you. on? Okay. So I also think that we are very influenced by the storytelling cultures we grow up in. So when you read a book by someone who is from West Africa, you can he almost hear the oral storytelling culture within the, the written pages. And, and I think the same goes for South African writing, and that's why our, our writing is also so distinct. No matter who's writing it, you can actually hear us. And I think that's what fascinates me so much about form and about just putting things down on, on paper. This is very interesting because we're talking about the outsiders, you know, characters who are disconnected. And Anke, when I started reading, uh, Bokang, I was like, hey, this guy is, he reads the way he would sound to me. But also, mm -hmm. you, you were very specific about not making it uh, a story that happens in 2020, or it's a story in, in the 90s, and I wanted to know why you made that choice. Well, I think the main reason was, well, there's two main reasons. One was that because it's a story about a teenager, I didn't want social media to be a part of the story. And it's hard to write about teenagers. Well, I thought it's hard to write about teenagers today without including social media because it has its own psychological influences. So then I chose to write about a world which I understood. So I was a teenager in the 90s. Um, so I felt like that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And I was part of a group of friends who had a way of speaking in a hip hop language which was unique to that group of underground hip hop heads. Mm. So I wanted to reflect that because I felt like this is what I relate to as a young person. Mm. Um, so yeah. Both you and Terry basically take people that are not necessarily insiders in, in, you know, in, in conventional contemporary um, fiction and you, you write them the way they speak and I think these are people who, if, you, if you've never experienced, maybe if you've never experienced how black and colored people tell a story, or if you've never experienced this, you know, this underground hip hop loving teenagers in the 90s, there's certainly like a disconnect when you first read it. But as you go along with it, there's, there's a kind of like musicality to it. And I found that with uh, Let's Go with you as well. And I don't know if that was an influence of, of poetry, because I know mm. you, you, you are a poet. Mm. Do you find that th there's like a, a rhythm that, that you have when you're writing? For sure, if I think the rhythm comes before the words actually, and I feel like I just try to sort of fit the words to the rhythm. Um, it's almost like a way of self-editing, just you, because it's hard to say what works and what doesn't, but it just, you know that there's an internal rhythm that you're trying to achieve and, and if, the, if the words don't fit it, it just, you just know what's wrong. Um, yeah, I still definitely I can feel that. But also, I, music was my first love as well. I was a, I was I used to be a singer, and I was just too shy. Hey, <laughs> a, a former rapper, <laughs> former singer, Terry Ann. What's your secret? You play the saxophone. Mm. No. <laughs> <laughs> I used to rap when I was 
six. <laughs> Come on, two former rappers and a former singer. I, I, yeah. I still rap. It's not a former rapper. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, because I was going to be like, let's start a band. I mean, I don't know what we'd call the band. The Outsiders. The Outsiders, I mean. yeah. Okay, it. please buy our album when it comes out. Spotify everywhere, Apple Music. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I always like to give... Sorry, actually, before we do the reading, you said something very interesting about social media and teenagers, and you didn't want to include that in the story. And I wanted to ask the three of you, do you feel like putting too much technology as we live with it now mm. kind of waters down the story, or does it put you exactly where you need to be? Sure, I'll go first. I think it depends on the story. So I, in one of my stories in, in, in White Chalk, I write um, about Facebook, and I think it's in um, Locked Down where the colored girl interacts with how the lockdown is affecting her through watching people's Facebook statuses. And it's a very minor thing in the actual story itself. But I think that it adds to this entire landscape of what lockdown became. It became a, a, a place where you would find community on social media. Mm where when I write my teenager stories, I do exactly what Onke did. I don't like to write teens in social media because I was not, I was a teen in the social, I'm not old, I was the teen in the, in the social media age, but it was not my reality. Um, okay. So I think I, I, I have this thing about authenticity. Uh, so I try really hard not to write what I cannot relate to at least 80% of the way. So I keep social media out of my teen stories because of that. And let's go clear with, with tech and social media. Does that affect uh, you not I so much? I was very deliberate not to join in the first place. When I, I mean, I, I was a 90s kid too, so I started ex social media, like MySpace, started coming in when I was in maybe my later years in high school. And I remember having it for a year and just being so obsessed. You know, I, like, I really, I don't have moderation of the things I do. So I just knew that it, this is not sustainable and I just never really went back. You know, um, in terms of how it affects stories, um, I feel like there's a there's inaction in the stories. It's like everything is happening on a screen. So it's, it's it's almost like when a friend is dating someone and she wants to know what he's doing, who he's dating, what he's like, and she just goes on his profile and she knows everything about him. And it takes the whole adventure about what he could be like, and it just you discover what a person is just too quickly. Um, so it does sort of, when it comes to writing, it does take away a lot of narration. Okay. Really. Yeah. No, I hear what you're saying. Yeah. So I do like for people to get a taster yeah. of, you know, what, what they can look forward to with your work. So I'm going to ask Onge to go first. How much time do I have? Because we could be here for a while. Ah, 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 ah. No, you, you don't have that much time. You can do two pages and maybe an extra page at most. Okay, I'll read from the very first chapter how the book starts. So it's based, it starts in April 1998. Mr. Knoll's suit looks like it's made from the same material as a seat belt. Cheap, dark brown and faded, probably as old as he is. Bogang, talk to me. He looks at me as if I owe him something. After all this time at the school and still this fool can't say my name right. No surprise, they're all like this. Look, Bogang, I'm here to help you. This is about what's best for you. I can't help you if you won't speak to me. Right, the only thing that matters to him is the school's reputation. He cares about me about as much as a butcher cares about animal rights. His eyes give him away. The stretched skin under one of them twitches. He waits. Silence is golden and patience is a virtue. Let's do this thing then. His office really sucks for a deputy's, for a deputy principals. It's not much of an office actually, but then again, he's not much of a deputy either. I bet the head and the other deputies laugh at his punk ass. Punk ass knows. That's what they should call him. His office is all the way at the back of the school, in the dead zone, where nobody ever goes. There's barely enough space for the two of us up in here, with his long legs and all. The walls aren't even the same color, and it stinks of boiled cabbage and old newspapers. Ten bucks says this used to be a cupboard or something. Somebody's stupid laugh comes from outside, loud and carefree. Other boys are there enjoying their break time while I'm stuck in here dealing with this petty nonsense. Mr. Knowles holds up his essay. Help me understand this, Bo Gang, please. He must think he's talking to one of his sorry ass kids when, he's, when they step out of line. So lame. Sir, I don't know what to say. 
This essay is, well, what can I say? Shocking, to say the least, don't you think? It's just an essay, sir. Just an essay? No. Bogang, this is a lot more, I think. He can believe what he wants. This fussing is way overboard. I actually thought I did pretty well on this one. You've written here about suicide, Bogang, in great detail. We're concerned about you. Why can't this damn chair swallow me whole and save me from all of this grief? Punk-ass knows with his punk-ass questions. Best for me, what the hell does anyone know about what's best for me? Mr. Knowles goes on to ask me questions about my school subjects. I tell him. He asks me about my teachers. I tell him that too. He asks me about English and my teacher, Mrs. Hargreaves. I tell him what he already knows. He wipes his hand across his spotted forehead. Talk me through this essay. Why suicide? It was the topic, sir. No. The task for Mrs. Hargreaves' essay was to design a project to address any social issue. You chose suicide, not as the social issue, but as the solution. The man has interesting books on his shelf, the titles running along the spines. One of them is really thick, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. It's like a Bible of the things that psychos cipher from, I bet. Probably has mad parables and verses of ins and outs of insanity, people's shortcomings and suffering, definitions of oddballs, treatments for the marginalized and normal run-of-the-mill shame-faced losers. But what does it say about the society that created them? Thank you so much for sharing that because as soon as I, when I started reading the second verse, as soon as I realized that, okay, his essay was about suicide, I was suddenly very interested, like a, a morbid curiosity, and maybe it's because it's something that I've, I've dealt with, you know. But I wanted to know this character is very disconnected. Um, or rather, the world around him is, is disconnected. And I wanted to know, how did you handle having a character who is nonchalantly moving through the story and then suddenly it's like, oh, okay, not so nonchalantly moving the story. I wanted to know how you handled Bogang's uh, journey and how it affected you. It was really, it was quite kind of weird for me because I really attempted to fictionalize, come up with a story that's not related to me. And I thought I did that well, but I realize now with the kind of questions people ask me that I put so much of myself in the book. And the realities of where Pokang lives is that he comes from a family that used to be well off. His parents got divorced when he was, I think, about 11 or so. And then they lost all that money, but he still lives in the suburbs. So that experience of having grown up in a family where there was money and no longer having money, he's also at an all-boys school. And he's having a lot of issues with that because he's not the most macho of people. He's actually more of a creative. And he's struggling in that environment. And then also at the same time, in his family, he's the only child that goes to that kind of school. So he also feels this disconnect of wherever he goes, sometimes he's not black enough, and in other situations, he's too black. So he's too black for the white kids, or he's too, he's too white for the black kids. So he's caught in that space. And he's also a boy in grade 11, or when, for teenage boys around the age of 17, 18 in the Eastern Cape, there's the whole initiation thing. So he's at that point in his life where his friends are going through the whole thing, but his family can't afford to send him there. And he's now contemplating what it's gonna mean for him. Um, he does eventually go through it in the book. So it also deals with that thing of, you know, how does he become a man in the world that he's living in? His father's an alcoholic, so he's dealing with th that issue as well. And then he's also a bit of a dreamer, um, someone who lives a very isolated existence, dealing with suicide, and he's trying to figure out his life throughout that. I deliberately chose first person narrative because I felt like I really wanted to get inside his head and you know, put the reader in the experience of what he's going through. Um, but also at the same time, I tried to make him quite naive. So if a person is reading it and you believe everything he says, hook, line, and sinker, then good luck because you're gonna fall <laughs> yeah. as but hard as he falls. Teenage boy. All they do is lie. <laughs> yeah, so you have to be very careful going with him on the journey. But I think, interesting, left the, like his father, I think especially, there are other characters in the book who I think almost steal the show from him, even though it's told in his narrative. Yeah. Um, and by being drawn into those characters, I think it allows a person to then start having question marks about this narrator who's telling you the story. Um, and when I wrote it, I think I was mid-30s and I was trying to reflect on some of the decisions I made as a teenager to get me to that point. So I was trying to 
start this discussion with myself to say, and so when I wrote it, I had older people in mind, people who are either beyond 40 or around that age or whatever. Yeah. Um, but it, I've found that it works e both ways, that even a much younger person can read it and feel like it allows them to think ahead of what's to happen. Um, I've had a few people say to me, yeah, but there are times there when he comes across as a bit of an older person, like who? And I'm like, yeah, well, I wrote it, remember? But, you know, yeah. but I think even in writing it, I try to put a bit of, he's thinking a lot about life. His, the things that are happening in his life have made him have to think a few steps ahead. I think what's interesting is when you said, imagine Catcher in the Rye meets Spud, but it's a, it's a, it's a black kid in South Africa. I appreciated the, the conversations, even though it wasn't outright that he was, he was having about his masculinity, where, where he stands you know, against other boys or against other people. And that's something that I find um, I'm always lacking when I read some, some fiction about like young men. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to know, was that a deliberate thing it was because my journey through an all boys school was a difficult one. And there are many things I enjoyed about it, but there's many things I've spent years trying to unlearn. Yeah. And I've, I struggled, especially when I got to first year varsity. I realized that I feel like I have deficits in my way that I just navigate the social spaces, mm -hmm. you know? So when I was writing it, I was definitely coming from that point of view. And I, it, in the way that, you know, it's often said that writing can be healing, it felt like for the first time in my life I'm addressing these things because I left that environment, felt like it was the worst time of my life, but never actually reflected on it and never actually spent months sitting and writing about it. So the process of writing the story helped me to sort of think a lot about all of that. And by the end of the story, I felt like, actually, no, it wasn't the worst time of my life. If a book came out of it, a book like this, you know, and so now I see it differently from the, having gone through the process of writing about it. So. I, I think it's always interesting how we sit down and we write a thing and we think we, we think we know exactly what we're doing. And then we get to the end of it and you go, how did I come to this ending of a book that I was so sure was going to end a different way? And let's say, I wanted to know from you, did you get to the end of the novella and go, this was not my plan? Yeah, absolutely. I did, it, it just ended and I, it wasn't the plan at all. Um, yeah, I, I think I didn't expect to be so peaceful in the end, you know? I thought it would just end with the same impact it begins with. Because it's quite, it, it's quite like, it's intense yeah. in the beginning. And, you know, you, you get the sense that I, I am sitting with an outsider. I'm sitting mm -hmm. with somebody who's observing things that have happened to them, mm -hmm. things that are currently happening to them. Mm -hmm. And it's quite, it, it, I, I found that I was holding my breath a lot. And it felt so good to get to the end and go, yeah. Okay, let's do that again. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, can you read something from the frightened parts? Um, I'll just read from the beginning, that's okay. So, it opens with, I don't mean to make a fool of myself. I'm just losing my mind, and I don't feel like doing it quietly. There is a story in me so full of stupidity and pain, I hesitate to write it. This delay may carry on for years, embedding itself in everything. I dread to say this to you, Lord, but if it is my passion that has me run towards pain, to feel it with such intensity, then you should take it back, make me simple, keep me sane, let me work in those boxes and wash and iron my clothes, let me feel the world lightly, Give me laughter, make me tame. This void, this not wanting anything at all. When I find no answers inside me, none in my hands that haven't known work for years, nor in my heart that has never stopped lying. If it comes with a mind that wants to know itself and grinds to the core where it is sore, then take it away from me, this querying eye, this thing in me which says, write. I mourned you. I mourned like a screaming child. I wrapped myself in brown blankets and woke up drenched in sweat when it wasn't enough to cry, when I had to drink myself into a drunken stupor until my eyes changed color, that unfading yellow, as if my home were in a dust bowl and I were too proud to leave. And then I went mad. I let the sleeves from my dress blow off my shoulders as I ran half naked through a breeze. That night it would rain and I would threaten to kill myself if it meant that I could sleep again, or that I could, 
and fuck the men that had ruined me. I'm sure you weren't aware that I could grovel. Sorry. The therapist recommends Mrs. Dalloway, where I read that madness is simply a loss of proportion. And in my case, I felt, as I imagined Virginia Woolf concede, that this was certainly a disproportionate response to sudden pain, but at its core lay something frightening and far more challenging to repair. I was simply no longer a child, and the ground was not solid, and the Eastern Cape was barren and poor, and I didn't have a driver's license. To witness true poverty when you know what it's like to live easily is something very hard to come to terms with. I felt in this moment so far away from you, so far below, and most incapable of reaching. I'm sure you weren't aware that I could grovel, that I could crawl beneath a can of worms and curse myself for being unable to, to slide below the earth on my belly. You must have thought I was slimpy slender, the slim daughter of a rich man. The thought alone is enough to think that I am conceited, but I think of you instead of all the men who lay on top of me, instead of being held down on my knees, wrist aching, where there was wetness and there was pain, instead of the short list of shame that has sampled my amplitude, I think of you who wanted nothing, not by force or labor. I had to puke the wine out of my belly, to fold my knees into my stomach to learn that there was something impure in the way I felt. There were needles in my arm, a drip to save my, a drip to save my liver. And being there as I was, you did nothing. To do nothing, to fold one's arms and do nothing, to float in a swimming pool and cup your ears to hear the ocean, to dive into a body of water and rise as if to be reborn. To do nothing is to do a lot. What did you do when I was dying? You can clap. <laughs> <laughs> so I think one of the things that I connected with almost immediately is because some of this stuff resonated very much with my own psychotic break. Yeah. And I think maybe that's why a lot of it made so much sense to me. I was reading this and I was like, mm-hmm. Yes, yes, this is the bad place. I remember the bad place. But one of the things that also struck me was when I thought about writing about my psychotic break, there was something about um, not, wanting, not wanting to seem mad, not wanting to seem like a crazy person. And I think the disconnect, the, or the, the outsider here is that a lot of the times you know, women characters aren't allowed a whole novella to kind of process their for lack of a better phrase, their madness. Yeah. And I realized when I read that, that I wish I had written about my psychotic break mm -hmm. in such a very, um, there's space for anger, mm -hmm. there's space for this is messy, mm -hmm. there's space for honesty. Yeah. And I feel like you did it so beautifully where you have a woman character going through the most yeah. in a very honest and angry way. Yeah. So tell Thank me you. about that process. Um, I think when you write about things as you're going through them, you tend to be a little bit more transparent. Um, because I think I spoke about this before, um, there's something about uh, being mentally vulnerable that makes it difficult for you to pretend. And, and I think pretense in a way is something that's, is sometimes, it's something we do, but it also shows that this person is even capable of cloaking themselves, which means they're relatively healthy, you know? I think when you're, when you're really vulnerable, it's almost like you're just naked and you can't, you can't hide, um, and it's awkward. And I think when I wrote, that's the state I was in. I couldn't, I couldn't pretend. I wanted to, I really, I think it's also why it took so long to write such a short book, is that I really wanted it to be more beautiful and less, you know, transparent, but it just was coming out this way, and I think I had to go through a process where I accepted that. Mm. Did you feel like you needed to, once you'd done it, you needed to step away yes. and then go back to it, and when you looked at it with fresh eyes, yeah. what was that process? I hated it. I looked at it, and I'm like, gosh, like, I mean, there, it, it's, it's, I was bipolar. First, I was like, wow, this is good. And then I was like, wow, this is awful. Like, you write so badly. And then I was like, okay, wait, no, you write really well. I, I, I couldn't decide whether it was good or bad. And I think it's because it wasn't written uh, with the intention of being beautiful. Mm. Um, and so I was struggling to, to connect with the lack of beauty because I felt with my first book that I, I was very deliberate in making things beautiful. Like, that mattered to me. And I just, I couldn't relate to this like this sort of crudeness, you know? Um, That's yeah. what it is. Yeah. It's the crudeness of the story yeah. that 
is so disconnected from what we expect the, the beauty and madness yes. almost and this yeah. is this is stripped down like yeah. when i read it i was like oh i know this <laughs> sunken place it is it's the sunken place yeah. and i i wonder how did the journey of writing this stepping away from it and going back to it mm. how did that affect you how did it change you the journey going back and reading it once it was done um i almost wanted it just out of the it, i really puked this book book out i i puked it out and i wasn't trying to eat it again and I, I just, you know, and I was just wanted that. somebody I'm going else. To use that. <laughs> you know? It's like you should be a writer or something. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I really just couldn't wait to write another book. I was like, wow, now I can actually just write something nice. You know, I, I was just, I was so happy. It was out of me, and it was done. And then there was the anxiety that wait, now it's going to enter other people for the first time, um, and they're going to look at me this way when I feel so far away from this person now. But, you know, maybe she's not that far, to be honest. Yeah, I'm just one wine glass away of a psychotic breakdown. <laughs> <laughs> it is a bad place, I'm yeah. telling you. It's funny, though, when, yeah. I, when, I, read, when I read The Frightened, mm. I, I, I wasn't even thinking about you. Yeah. I was thinking about me. I was mm. like, wow, I know that, like, that raw, granular place where mm. it feels like there's sand under your eyes, there's sand mm. under your skin. You just, you can't get, you can't get away from yourself. Yes. Yeah. And I think it's beautiful. Yeah. You should get The Frightened. Uh, when it's out, but also you should get the rest of Little Gutli's work. She's, she's so... Uh, just, she's that with words. <laughs> uh, you see, this is why I'm not a writer. She's that <laughs> with words. Uh, Terry ann it's your turn to read, and you're going to read one of my favorite stories, Fight Club. Yeah. Uh, cool. So uh, I'm really sorry that I will not be reading about suicidal mental breakdowns. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody's got to do it. I, you know, it's the burden. Um, so I, I'm, I'm not going to read the beginning. I'll just explain that. So we have Auntie Mabel, and she's somewhere in the leafy suburbs of Johannesburg, and she's being interrogated by a dude, and he is asking her to tell him the events of what happened. So this is her telling him the events of what happened. Okay. <clears throat> that morning, I woke up at 4 o'clock. Or well, how do you people say? 4 a.m. to get ready for work. You see, I work in industria, and I must get up very early, or else the taxis will make me late. And then the burro will go on like it's my fault that there was traffic. So yeah, I woke up at 4 o'clock and put on water to wash. I can't even put on water for tea. I must just wash and get ready, or else I will miss my special with Lester. And he is always on time. You know, his mother was such a nice auntie, but shame, and you know, mm. she died of lung cancer. <laughs> yeah, ne, that's a horrible illness. My cousin Letta had cancer, but she went for the chemo and the radiation, and now she's fine. Mm. I wonder why Lester's mother didn't go for the chemo or the radiation. Maybe the cancer was bad already when she found out. No, shame. So as I was saying, before you gave me a fail cake, I put on the water to wash and I could already hear commotions going on in the street. They said on the news that that noise was one of the first signs. That is just cuck if you ask me. First signs of what? How was I supposed to know? So I put the water in the scuttle and then I went to go and wake up my daughter Valencia. You know her most. She's very clever. She always gets the awards at school for maths and English, and she sings in the choir and does praise and worship at church. And she's pretty also. She gets it from me. I was a whoop cop when I was at school. My only problem is that I like nice times and parties. And boys, I liked boys. <laughs> Look where that got me. I could have been far now if I didn't like things. Valencia is a child that likes the house. She doesn't even have a boyfriend. Can you believe it? She knows that the boys here are just a bunch of rubbishes. They go and make children with anything that has a nuffy, and then they don't even pay pap geld for their children. Mm -hmm. My child is very clever. She knows she must stay away from that gemors. Mm -hmm. Here, that child is going to take me places. She <laughs> will get a permanent job in the bank, and then she can help me extend the house. Mm -hmm. I just want to make the lounge bigger, you know, and maybe put in new tiles in the kitchen. And then I want to put in built-in cupboards in all of the bedrooms. Ooh, yeah, uh, wardrobes are so out of fashion. <laughs> and Valencia knows that we must work together to make that house nice. That is our inheritance. It is our family home. 
She's not like her useless brother Tyrone. Ooh, ask me where he slept last night, huh? He's always in the street, that one, gallivanting. I can't rest for say silly. So, as I was saying, I went to go and wake up Valencia because even though she's a clever child, she's also a lazy one. Mm -hmm. And you must wake her up very early if you want her to get to school by 7 o'clock so that she can be a scholar patrol. I went to bath and then I packed my bag with my new overalls and took my scuffed in out of the microwave. Tyrone didn't cut my meat. Oh, sorry, Tyrone didn't eat my meat that morning. I was very happy to see him. Tyrone will so much just eat the meat in my scuffed in and not feel sorry that he did it. It's very unfair. I work for that meat, buy that meat, cook that meat, and then he comes and eats my meat. <laughs> I didn't even say goodbye to Valencia, and I didn't see Tyrone sleeping on the couch. That explains why the meat is still in my lunch tin. I just ran out of the house because I could hear the engine of that crocky Lester drives. I got outside just in time for the transport. I must told you, Lester is always on time, and he's not a person that likes to wait. I usually sit in, in the seat behind the driver, but Lena Langtetter was in my seat that morning. Oh, yeah. I could so much smack her there in that kumbi, but I needed the special, the Lord knows. I don't want to go back to taking taxis. Lester doesn't even work near our factory, so I don't know. Oh, sorry, Lena doesn't even work near our factory, so I don't know what she was doing in my seat in Lester stuck in a kumbi. <laughs> So, Terry Ann, you talk about, you know, your, your love for identity and exploring it in, in, in books. And when I read this short story collection, it was suddenly like you'd taken people that were not conventionally in literature and you brought them right into my home. Like, for instance, Fight Club. What's really interesting about Fight Club is actually what Auntie Mabel is talking about. I don't even know what happened with the fighting. It's not actually important. It's about how she just talks about her day and she's being interrogated and she's like, but listen to what I'm telling you. We'll get to what you're asking me. <laughs> and I think what's amazing is you've got all of these beautiful characters and some of them really, really tragic. And I want to know what brought you to this short story collection? And how did the journey change you? What brought me was necessity, because um, Nadia didn't give me a choice. <laughs> <laughs> like, she oh. said, write a book. She was like, write a book. So um, I did, but I think when I started actually like thinking about what I'm going to write, I really wanted to, I wanted to write stuff I wanted to read. Mm. And I started, you know, uh, the first story that I wrote was the first story in the book, mm -hmm. which is uh, Rockabye Baby. And Rockabye Baby is very personal. I puked that story out because it, 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 what happened to, to um, Jay happened to me. Oh, so, sorry. yeah, it's okay. So, um, you know, I, I, I wrote it and I wanted to really get into the mind of who I was when I started writing that story. And then I started noticing with every other story that came after Rockabye Baby, I wanted to write stuff I wanted to read. And that's where these disconnected characters then started making their way into the book one by one. And at the end of the collection, I was so tired because I'd written 18 stories in, in three months. And I'm oh, sorry, what? Yeah, you're <laughs> Teach me never doing wave. that again. <laughs> oh my God, I, I'm so glad my agent is not here. Yeah. <laughs> what? It was. I was there. You see there. <laughs> <laughs> you were in the when bad place. I, when I was done, I was, when she read it, I was like, yes, then that, and then I was that also, and then I was there, and I was floating in the pool, and I, that's where I was. Because it was so difficult to embody all of these people. Mm -hmm. And everybody you're trying to write has a cuck thing going on. I mean, mm. it's, it's funny that Auntie Mabel, that Tyrone eats the, the scuffed in out, well, the meat out of her scuffed in. But also, she does cook that meat and she mm. does buy that meat and he's gallivanting and eating. Her. That's a cuck thing, you and know? And he has no remorse as well. <laughs> she has no remorse. Like none. And he does it <laughs> continuously. So mm. when I looked back at it, I was like, I... This is normal to me because I have a cousin that eats the meat out of the lunch tins constantly. Tango. Constantly. And when he read the story, I was like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> How many people 
actually <laughs> recognize themselves in your stories? I recognize. Uh, when you were talking about that, I'm like, just when she was just, the way she digresses as she's speaking, it just, that's my mom. Um, <laughs> that is, you know? Yeah, no, I it's, just, it's frustrating. It's like, just come, you know? Can you just, <laughs> yeah. can we get to the point, <laughs> ma'am? So, oh, every person that I remember homecoming, I didn't even know I was writing about my husband. Okay. Mm. I didn't even know. I just wrote a story about a girl on a plane. And when he read Homecoming, he was like, you didn't need to put my business out like that. <laughs> and I was like, you're not even colored though. <laughs> How is this your business? <laughs> you know, but then I started to realize that everything I write has this sort of personal element to it. And everybody that reads it sees themselves and they have so far taken it nicely because it's fiction. So if the day I have to write a memoir, it's gonna be cuck, but yeah. <laughs> I'll be ready for that day. <laughs> so uh, this is the part where we want to hear from you. I'm sure you have a million questions that I have to keep my eye on the time. So does anybody have any questions? Oh, it always takes one person. Here's our brave soul. After this, six hands will go up. <laughs> uh, the mic is making its way down to you. It's tough for the people closest to us, though, I think. Because we can see their faces. Yeah. Exactly. Like if you ask, ask the wrong question, <laughs> we'll meet you outside. <laughs> yes, please. Um, I guess I always ask about writing and creative practice as a form of healing, because it's something I'm very curious about. So I want to know, especially like writing from the eye of the storm, or like the mental health storm. Um, does it make you, when it's done, when it's out, when that thing that has a hold of you has finally let go of you, does it make you feel more compassionate um, towards yourself? Does it make you feel more connected to parts of yourself? Mm. Does it feel like healing? I, I always try to understand that, so I want to ask, I guess, all of you. Um, I, can, um, I think what I was hoping for was not so much to heal. Yes, I, I hope to heal, but I, I just wanted it to be possible to be redeemed because I felt like redemption was such a male narrative. You know, it was just so rare to find stories of people who did such bad things, women who did such bad things, who sort of had a whole hero's journey and, and were redeemed in the end. So I just wanted to know if it was possible to share this much and for people to be like, it's okay, we're, we're okay with you now. Because um, I, I, yeah, I think, when I was alone in my room, I felt I'm the worst person on earth and I, I do not deserve to be heard or loved or anything. So I felt like by writing something, if people can receive it and forgive me, it almost gave me a redemption arc. That was sort of my, my vibe. Do you guys have an answer for that? Yeah, I do. I think for me, once it was finished, like now I get surprised all the time in spaces like this when people talk about it or people give me feedback because I almost didn't realize what I produced. I mean, it might sound naive for me to say that, but I honestly didn't realize, and you realize from people relating to what you've said, and then you suddenly realize there's people that can relate with certain aspects of what you've written there. And then you start reflecting on what process did I follow while I was writing it, um, and being able to relate with other people, then you realize, oh, so I wasn't alone in going through something like this, and what, Terry Ann mentioned about the vomiting um, out a story that's really true to your core. Mm -hmm. I think the, the first draft of this book I wrote in four months, and mm -hmm. I was surprised Damn. that it, it came out Who so quickly. Who are you? <laughs> <laughs> but I think when it's so true to your personal story, it just comes out almost that easy, and you can't stop. Once you've opened that valve, it's hard to stop going back. So I find when I'm writing that kind of story, it sort of comes out a lot easier. And then at the end of it, I feel like, okay, great. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it is a nice process, I suppose, mm -hmm. or healing process. Tyria? I think I had two separate journeys with that exact um, thing. So in the first book, I wrote through mental illness. So I wrote those 11 cages when I was a very, very, the place was darker than the night with no moon when I wrote that uh, book. And I wanted, I wrote those 11 cages to find joy because it was a, a, a remembering of who I was when I was a teenager. And I always used to count my teenage years as one of the most joyful times in my life. So 
in the practice of writing those loving cages, I found myself again because I was like, you were that girl, bro, mm -hmm. and now look at you, you know. Um, and then with White Chalk, I wrote about mental illness. Mm -hmm. And that was a journey on its own because now I have to write about things like bipolar disorder, about things like depression, things that I go through on a daily basis and still have not figured out. And I have to write about it and fictionalize it. And that was, um, I think that's what ended me back in the sunken place because I, I read what I wrote and I was like, Jesus, wow. You know, and, and it, it almost depressed me again just to realize that we love like this. The, mm. This is our existence, you know. Mm. Any other questions? Oh, back there. You see, I told you, you started it. Um, Leto, in, earlier you spoke about how when you were writing that you felt that this transparency was different from that of beauty. And I wanted to ask, is there something, well, for me, I sometimes find transparency can be beautiful or is beautiful. Is, is, is in your writing or in your work, is there a separation between the two? And what is this, uh, the difference between the beauty that transparency might reveal and the beauty that you've spoke, you were speaking about in your previous works? Okay. Um, I like that question. Thanks. Um, I think maybe the difference was, because I mentioned earlier in your elevator pitch that I had to re-educate myself about my body. And I think maybe when I used to write, I would try and I objectified myself in, in the writing. And now I was trying to write from my perspective and my body is, is a very unpleasant place to live in. I bleed once a month and it's very painful and smelly. And, and, and also sex is such an underwhelming experience for the majority of the time and I have to come to terms with that. <laughs> and I just had to be honest about how uncomfortable it is to be in a, a female body sometimes. Um, you know, it, it, it hurts, like you, we have painful bodies but also gross bodies. And so I was trying to, so like it was very difficult to sort of write from that kind of place and look back and be like, wow, she's talking about a period or wow, she's, it's just, it just felt gross to me. I was re I educated myself into trying to kind of write around my body rather than from inside it. Um, I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah. Love me a good period story. Uh, <laughs> there's a question over here. Yeah. Hi, thank you for a wonderful panel. Hi, Barbara. Hello. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I wondered, it's a question for all three panelists. Um, you, you all spoke about puking it out because it's a work based on personal experience, perhaps, or bodily sensation. But um, do, you, do you have different modes of writing? Are there some stories that are puked out and then are there others that are plotted out? Um, in terms of process, do you choose maybe, okay, I'm going to write this story where it's not that process of, of just getting it out on the page, but you, yeah, I just wonder if you have different ways of entering stories or if all of your experiences of writing are this kind of visceral bodily function almost. Thank you. I'll go first because I've got like many stories in here. <laughs> so um, I think they are like the ones that we we puke out, right? And I, the Rockabye Baby is, the first and the last stories are really just emotional, wah, on a page. Um, but then there's the Owens, and Fight Club, and Night Vigil, and Matric Dance, and even Operation Modderfontein. Those stories, I sat and I did character Bibles, and <laughs> I was writing like, you know, this from this um, almost like a filmmaker point of view of how technical I wanted to be in, in growing these characters, in teasing out this narrative. So I, I do have some stories where I write for, for, for writing's sake and, and, and not necessarily for it to be cathartic. And I think that it's so important when you are a writer to have those stories where you take it on almost from a place of being technical, um, just to keep the fun in it, you know? Because if you, if you puke too much, you're gonna be dehydrated. And <laughs> like, it's just... And it'll affect the enamel of your teeth. Yes. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, 
I spaced out. <laughs> 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 um, I was, uh, what was the question again? Uh, all the stories, are there some stories that are technical that, you know, there, there's like craft as opposed to all of them just being puked out? Oh, no, I think usually I really think a lot about what I want to write. Um, but I think now going forward, I'm going to try and do both because I was very happy with what I discovered in writing by not trying to curate everything. Um, and also it, puking is, is a very involuntary thing. So you can't really decide, okay, today I'm going to puke out this story. <laughs> I think that happens because it just, that's the time you're in and it comes out that way. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think for me, I'm a very meticulous person. So even the stories that I'll say come out as if I puke them out. Um, all my first drafts. We're saying puke now. We're yeah. saying it over and over. You started <laughs> this. <laughs> I really wanted this to be a classy panel. I just hope <laughs> you know. There was going to be no talk of puking, eating the puke. What the hell? Experience, come experience. on. We're two sentences away from diarrhea. I'm so sorry. <laughs> you just said it. You just said it. <laughs> sorry, Uncle. So I feel, for me, the first draft will always come out I think it's, the, it's when I'm most free, yeah. and I just allow myself to do whatever. But if it's a story that's very personal to me, then I think the time of how long it takes to come out will be very quick. Um, even though the first draft came out in four months, I think I went through like seven or eight different drafts of the book, so in a space of like three to four years. Yeah. So it's just a matter of when and how I do it. You know, So I read a lot on how to improve the craft, and I always feel like, the book is not finished because I always want to go back and tinker some more and, and mess with it because it never seems mm. good enough, you know. Mm. So when the editor said to me this one was ready to be published, I was like, there's so many things I still want to fix, but, mm. I, you know, teach me more. I need to know what yeah. to fix because mm. there are things that mm. need to be fixed there. So mm. then when I saw the simplicity of the final draft, and by simplicity, I think just how it flowed, yeah. um, it was shocking to me because I didn't, it seemed easier but it wasn't easy because I knew of everything that I had to go through to get to that stage. Mm. So. so I know we've been talking about puking, Terry, and diarrhea. <laughs> um, and I, I, I just want to end with what, what, is, what is the joy in your work? Where does the joy in your work come from? We literally have three minutes. Don't make me time you. <laughs> okay, I'll start with you. Where, where is the joy in, in, in your craft? Where, what is the joyful thing? Um, well, I've always been a loner my whole life, and I've always felt like I don't really fit in in lots of places. Mm. And then knowing that I can do something like writing with that loneliness mm. has been very affirming. Like, it makes me feel like, oh, wow, okay. And for me, imagining a story feels exactly like how I used to feel as a kid playing with toys. Yeah. Like, mm. making up things. So, for me to suddenly feel that way as a man at 40, suddenly, it feels like, oh gosh, I don't know how I reconnected with that, but I love that feeling. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's talk with I think it's always having the last word. Really. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I always think about that. I mean, you know, I once, I once dated someone who really tried to publicly sabotage me, you know, and I remember thinking, but I'll, your kids' kids are going to be reading a book from my perspective about okay. who you were. <laughs> They're gonna have a perspective on you that you cannot defend. <laughs> I'll have the last word. <laughs> I like that, you know, uh, connecting with my inner child, little <laughs> because I said so and now it's over. <laughs> I'm taking that back. <laughs> Tyrion, where's the joy for you? Uh, I think the joy for me is in my 14 year old niece. Damn, is she 14? She's, I think she's 14. Um, in her coming and going, Yote, you wrote about a bash. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did. <laughs> so it's just that. Uh, it's colored kids going, wow, you wrote about, you know, our school is in your book. Like, Kippy Starvin is in your book. And, and Kippy himself going, thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. And, and so that, and that was the joy of those 11 cages. And I think it's the joy of white chalk is now academics coming in. Like, oh shit, you can actually write. <laughs> so yeah, um, the feedback is, is, is the joy. Mm. Thank you, the three of you. This has been the best use of a Saturday this whole year for me. Um, I really want us to, to put this band together because I can just see it's going to be so dynamic and so cool. We already have uh, the first people who are going to buy the album. Thank you so much. Um, the writers will be signing their books. Um, 
over there by the books. I forgot what it's called, please. But that's where they are. Thank you so much for being so amazing. And uh, that's it for us. Wow, look at that. I'm on time. Come on. Thank you. Thank you.